The Scream Kings are in no way responsible for any encounters with the paranormal, extraterrestrial abductions, eldritch insanity, hauntings, hexes, curses, demonic possessions, cryptozoological sightings, or any loss of sleep from listening to this podcast. Welcome to the Scream Kings podcast. I'm NJ Gallegos. And this is Nathaniel Darkish. When you wake up, scream. Scream all you want. There is no escape from the podcast. (laughs) Today, we have Michelle Miller, a fantastic author that I've met on Twitter. Um, We banter a bit back and forth, and uh, she's fantastic. So, welcome to the podcast. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Uh, I am uh, really thrilled to, to be a part of this and to talk about books and movies. It's like These are my favorite subjects. And now I'm happy that I get to hear your actual voice. So now whenever I read your tweets, I can have, have it just internally there, you know? Yeah, I, uh, I, I don't, you know, I guess I could put W's in all of my words, right? Because I'm... Uh, supposedly people tell me I have a, a really strong New York accent. I don't hear it. I think they're imagining it, but that's what they tell me. <laughs> I think it's fantastic. So um, tell us a little bit about yourself. What do you do? So I, I'm in a, both an attorney and the author of, of four novels. I'm the general counsel at a, a not-for-profit agency that helps uh, people re-entering from prison and impacted by the criminal legal system, so we do all kinds of services for them. And uh, it's a very, it's a big job, something like yours, NJ. Yours is the only job I know of, an author as prolific as you, who has that bigger day job, but it's a big job. And, and in my spare time, besides having raised a couple of kids um, and having a 100-pound dog and two very needy cats, I have written four novels uh, in the last 10 years or so. My latest one is called The Lower Power, and it's a supernatural, I guess, crime thriller, supernatural thriller. And um, my other horror novel is called The 13th Step Zombie Recovery, uh, which is sort of satirical, although I didn't think there was anything funny, but people seem to laugh at it. (laughs) There's sort of satirical take on a zombie zombie apocalypse, we talk more about it, um, and written a couple of uh, crime thrillers as well. Dang, you have quite the catalog on you. That's impressive. Thank you. yeah, there was a there's a there's a, a best-selling author whose name I won't drop who who likes to say that I've lived more lives than a cat. So, and he <laughs> thinks that helps helps my writing. And you will see a lot of my you know odd personal experience or unusual personal experience in in my in my books. It just makes you more interesting. Yeah, I mean, so the, the, the part of my, of my background that makes me unusual is, is the fact that in my, in my t- well, from the age of 13 to the age of 29, uh, off and on, more on than off, I was an addict and, you know, and ultimately a heroin addict. Um, and even though I graduated NYU Law School at 22 years old, I was facing 15 to life in prison at 26 years old. And so, uh, in my long story, I overcame addiction, homelessness, poverty, uh, violent crime, and incarceration to come back and make it back to practicing law. And I've been practicing law for the last 25 years or so, all all in public service. That is, that is inspiring. And... I, you can honestly tell, having read both The Lower Power and then recently I read The 13th Step Zombie Recovery, you can see how your experiences have influenced your writing. And it makes it m- that much more impactful. So, right, and, and that's basically. why I like, I, you know, I, I think the emphasis I have on, you know, the things that I really like in uh, my favorite things in horror are like what they call social horror. So I really... Uh, like horror that exposes life that I'm not 
accustomed to that I don't know about. And, and then characters uh, overcome a lot of adversity and where you end up in the end questioning what was worse, the human horror or the supernatural horror. So that's, that's something that I love to read books like that where I sit back or afterwards or see movies like that, you know, like Get Out, you know, uh, I guess would be the, the prime example that everybody knows. Um, and then think about what I've, what I've seen, not just because it scared me, which it, you know, it, it should, but because it, it had some a message, or, you know, that I was coming away with that was interesting and, you know, worthwhile. Yeah, I, I think I, that, that's great. Yeah, I, I definitely agree that social horror can be so rewarding. You know, that's it's definitely kind of like the the fun go to for, you know, people like, well, why are you into horror? Well, I mean, you know, like horror can make all of these great points and all that. And it can also just be ridiculous, slapstick, gory nonsense. But I like that we get the whole gamut there and that social horror really can be so meaningful, you know, even just to, to showing someone's life experience, even if it doesn't necessarily have some great message for the world. Obviously it can, but, you know, sometimes it, it can just be like, hey, this is what this person's life is like. And um, that's horrifying. And also, yeah, I don't know. Yeah, I, you know, I think one, one uh, movie that comes to mind, I hope I'm not jumping too far ahead, but that comes to mind about that. Where, like, it's not really that there was, like, a huge message, except that you were, you know, the message was in actually getting to know the characters. And that was, like, it's sort of like science fiction-y, but to me it seems like horror and that's the movie Attack the Block. I don't know mm. if you guys have seen it. It sort of got a cult following. It was a very, very, very low budget movie, <laughs> or at least it, based on the, the special effects. But, you know, it starts off with these kids that are like sort of the prototypical people that you wouldn't want to meet on a, on a dark block, and they're, they're mugging somebody, and they're really scary, and, and then you get to know them when they're fighting this this monster or monsters and 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 you you get a really good look at how you know everybody's got something good inside them and that people aren't what they seem yeah i like that yeah that one is is a ton of fun um yeah <laughs> yeah british 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 street thugs versus uh very t toothy aliens yeah they 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 were very strange aliens <laughs> I I'll have that. to add that to my list. I haven't seen that one. Oh, you've got to. I, you know, it's so weird. I get these favorites, and I'm like, you, you know, you really, really got to see that one. Yeah, I mean, it has uh, John Boyega, who is, you know, Finn in Star Wars, and it has uh, Nick Frost from most of most of the the movies made by. Uh, Oh, gall. Why am I blanking on names? This is my, like, favorite director, and I can't remember his name right now. Oh, well, eh, let's, I'll just edit that out in post. Um, anyway, lots of, lots of great people on it. Well, you'll tell us later. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. It'll come to me in, like, five minutes, and then I'll go, oh, yeah, my favorite director. Yeah, the it's, other thing I really like is... is, is um, plots that weave in like a sort of political theme and not necessarily from you know progressive conservative not necessarily that although I do have my my preference but like I I'm thinking of like World War Z when it first came out when it was actually now it's very dated so I, I think a lot of people if they and I don't mean the movie but I mean the book mm -hmm. if you read the book now you might not get all of the references, the pop references, the political references, but when it, when it came out, it was just like so on point and so hilarious. Sorry, yeah, I'm, on yeah. my, I'm on my laptop. I don't know if you could hear the notifications coming in in the middle of the night from my job. Like, what is wrong with these folks? You know? <laughs> <laughs> Nothing <laughs> sacred, <laughs> come on. No, I love both World War Z and um, was it an oral history of the zombie war or whatever it's called? But um, would you would you say zombies are your favorite horror like trope subject? Um, I don't know if it, it, it's one of my one of my favorites. Like I don't read well. So much of it is not that great. 
that's what's written. If I if it's a good zombie novel, nothing really beats it. But I do like post-apocalyptic things overall, books overall, because it, that whole thing of everything being swept clean and starting fresh. But I was obsessed with zombies until I wrote my own zombie book, and um, so. You know, and it, it's just, it is such a fantastic trope because you could put anything into it. Like, it could be about whatever you want it to be. Like, and I personally wanted it, you know, well, I always say that if I have a resentment, I could write an entire book out of it. Like, I'll come up with a crime plot or a horror plot out of a resentment. <laughs> and I had this, like, I had this little bit of a, uh, I don't know if it was a resentment as well. If you write a whole book out of it, you might say it's a resentment. There were, a <laughs> there were, there were, a it would sort of might be sticking to you. But there was, there were a couple of things that just led me, you know. Okay, now I'm going to be really petty. Well, first off, there was, a, there were, I, I didn't really like the super cult like. AA meetings that was seemed to be getting very popular back then. So, but I do I love I love you know recovery. I love twelve step fellowships. So it was sort of an inside is like sort of critique of all the like silliness that goes on in recovery because the thirteen step <laughs> zombie recovery is about is about a zombie apocalypse where the only people who can have any ability to evade zombies are people with the addict alcoholic gene or children of addicts or alcoholics and so they have that gene and, and then the zombies don't really like sense them the way they could just sort of like kill everybody else immediately. So they have to sort of get along with each other and survive and <laughs> escape New York and find a safe place and you know so um, so that's why, like, I, I, there's a, it's sort of a love letter to, like, you know, the recovery programs, but also just a little bit of, like, you know, insider satire. Um, but I also had, you know, at the time, right before I read it, like, wrote it, you know, I don't know about you, NJ, but, like, like, if you get the idea for a first chapter when you have an overall idea, then it's like the whole book writes itself almost, you know, but it's always for me, like if I can get that first chapter. So I'm at this job and I, we're in the middle of a merger and there's, there's, it was sort of a little hostile, right? Between these two agencies. <laughs> and so this other agency comes in and they, um, and I don't, I'm not getting along with this woman from this other agency who like, like sh I just think that she's wrong about just about everything. And we get into this little, like, you know, one of those, like, wor you know, professional work disagreements and stuff. I remember the day before the big event happened. And the next day, she and seven of her coworkers won a 380 million jackpot, lotto jackpot. Right. So <laughs> it's yeah, it's exactly how you set up your book. Yeah, it's fantastic. And so it gave me the idea of what if there's a zombie apocalypse when they go to when they go to pick up their winnings at the press conference. <laughs> you know, because it's like and that's where the idea came from and a whole book came out of that. It's just so brilliant because that's exactly how life works, like oh, you finally, you get a book deal or they're adapting it or you win the lotto and then, of course, the zombie apocalypse happens. Like <laughs> Exactly. And I don't know about you, but if you have, like, negative thinking, like, I can't even have a lotto fantasy because at the end of the lotto fantasy, I always have a terminal illness, you know? <laughs> you can't even enjoy your winnings. <laughs> I know. <laughs> so anyway, I wrote a whole book that ended up... Uh, but that was fun. It was fun to write. Like, I have to say, like, if you say, what is my favorite? Like, I really, I shouldn't be pushing a book that's 10 years old, but, and I'm not, because, you know, because it really is not a new book, but, but it was really fun. I'm pushing it. I think that everybody should read it. It was great. Uh, yeah, no, no, push away. That, that is exactly the kind of thing that, uh, one, I need to read, and two, our, our listeners need to read, because it sounds freaking great. Uh, I'm all about books uh, written uh, with a more than a little bit of spite fueling it. <laughs> I hear you. It's like therapy, right? I mean, you're working through your uh, grievances and issues by writing this book, and now look, you're totally healed as a person. So there you go. Exactly. Well, I, you know, definitely a lot of catharsis, right? Exactly. I don't know who you were mad about with your book, uh, the 
is it the broken heart? Is that? I'm yeah. Like, yeah. yeah. The broken heart. I don't know why. I'm, it's after 10, so I'm, excuse me. But, um, yeah, I mean, you were like a little pissed off at that dude. <laughs> it's just, it's, it's just the patriarchy in general, I guess. I don't, I don't really know. <laughs> <laughs> oh boy, I wouldn't want it. Well, it's better that you take it out on the book than on your patients. Yeah, right. Exactly. I'm like I'm like Patch Adams, but when I come home, I just put it on paper and we put it away. And sometimes we get it published. Terrifying, terrifying Patch Adams. Yeah. Patch Adams in a Pennywise suit. <laughs> and very vulgar. Very vulgar. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But it's fine. So what would you say is the um, horror media that scared you the most? Any, any, any movie or book that just kept you up all night? That's interesting. You know, and it's not like I shouldn't have expected this. You know, I don't know. You know, the crazy thing is that uh, I don't get too scared. <laughs> I don't get too scared. The funny thing is I go to sleep with my ear pods on listening to Audible and some of the stuff that I listen to that puts me to sleep is it's scary the fact that it puts me to sleep that I actually will like it will like you know like NJ's book lull me to sleep while there's like murder and mayhem going on I do have to say that I mean you know I don't want to jump ahead but the serpent in the rainbow the guy being buried alive and being fully conscious of what's happening that's that's scary and I guess get out was scary like that where he was mm-hmm. stuck in somebody else's body yeah the sunken place is very conceptually upsetting yeah yeah um yeah that was really bad and and not so different like the idea like whenever I see anything like say about a vampire being buried for thousands of years like I guess I'm not supposed to be feel sympathy for the vampire but I'm like oh my god like I'm a person who can't sit still long enough to meditate for 20 minutes so the idea (laughs) of being like stuck someplace like conscious and like having to sit still you know I don't know but I think you guys I have this feeling you guys might be workaholics like me like just sitting still that's scary enough to like uh, (laughs) yeah that's scary you know just so, so, so I guess the ultimate terror would be like uh, the Stephen King story, The Jaunt, with, you know, the uh, being trapped for millennia, essentially, in, in your own mind. I don't think I've read that. Oh. I've seen that. Very oh. good. You'd oh, The to. Jaunt is incredible. It's, it's, it's about transportation or teleportation, but with a, a little bit of a, you know, Stephen Kingy twist. Uh, I'm not going to say any more because I've already kind of spoiled too much. Oh, that's okay. I was glad when I saw that you guys have spoilers because that makes it so much more fun to, to talk about the stuff. I mean, unless you're the person having it spoiled. But, um, yeah, I mean, Stephen King is like, was a huge, a huge uh, influence. I'd say if there's anybody, you know, especially the early King. Like, I just lived for each release of his books, you know, throughout decades you know it was just the highlight of a really dismal life for quite a while there and uh you know like even in the depth of my heroin addiction I would run to get a Stephen King book you know books actually really kept me kept me going so I'm going to ask you a very important Stephen King question okay let's see have you you read the Dark Dark Tower Tower? I read the first few hmm Right, I read The Dark Tower, but then I gave up after a few, a few books because he was taking like years between books, and then I wouldn't remember what had happened in the last books. So well, I mean, they're, now all they're all out now. All out. Yeah, I know, but now I'm like, you, I already like, I don't want to reread them. <laughs> <laughs> how you know about, what I'm saying? I'll give you how, however far you've gone, I'll just like summarize it in like a paragraph. So you're really <laughs> recommending this, I take it. Oh, yeah. As, as a King fan, you, you see the, the insane interconnectivity of everything, and you go, wait, what? How is that? What? And uh, Yeah, yeah, it's, it's, he finds ways. I guess to... I have to start it again. Yeah, like, like, it takes a couple books before you start to see all of the insane connections, but... Um, yeah, as a King fan, I think you'll really enjoy finding how, you know, it is connected to 
uh, insomnia is connected to the Tommy knockers is connected to the stand. Yeah. Everything. Yeah. That's interesting. Okay. Okay. I'll, I'll have to do that. I, I actually like his horror better than his crime though. though I, I will say his most recent dip into crime, which was definitely firmly in horror to uh, his newest book, uh, Holly, uh, I worked real well for me. I'm going to have to look at it. I mean, Holly is a great, she's a great character. Mm -hmm. Like, she was kind of the high point of his crime yes. journey. Yeah, no, the Holly, the, the Holly book is, is about um, some very upsetting criminals uh, that, that she gets uh, involved in trying to hunt down that uh, just, it's, it's not uh, what you would expect from, like, the, the Mr. Mercedes books. It's a lot. It's a lot darker, and uh, Interesting. I really enjoyed it. Like it's not really supernatural or anything. Like I mean, in theory, it could legitimately happen. Yeah. Well, Steve, Stephen King always says that horror does not have to be supernatural. You know, like what is it? Uh, misery, where she the sort of body horror, horror. Oh yeah, Misery, Cujo, like a lot of a lot of his most effective horror really does. Just stay firmly grounded in reality. Right. Right. That magnificent man. Well, shall, shall we tackle the uh, serpent in the rainbow, the movie that you have chosen? Sure yes. thing. Uh, let, me, let me briefly introduce some, some key information about this, and then we'll uh, uh, talk a little bit about why you chose it and a little bit about the plot. Um, so, Serpent in the Rainbow came out in 1988 and was dressed, directed by the late, great Wes Craven. Um, the credited writers, uh, we have Wade Davis uh, in that it was inspired by his book, loosely, I will add. Um, and, and then the screenplay was by Richard Maxwell and Adam Rodman. So, uh, why did you want to go with Serpent in the Rainbow? Well, you know, we were talking about voodoo, and, and my book, The Lower Power, has, you know, some voodoo angle to it. And so we were thinking, oh, well, let's, you know, let's look at voodoo. And it was interesting because I was, there's not that much really great voodoo out, you know, to the extent that I would have thought. And then I polled, you know, I have all my, all my, uh, I guess I'm of the generation where I still have everybody I ever knew that is on Facebook, and I just, the, you know, the only time they ever, you know, say any, talk to me or pay any attention to me is if I ask a question about, like, give me a recommendation for a voodoo movie. And so, so uh, there were a bunch of things, and, like, I, oh, I'm forgetting what the name, there was another, there was another movie that I started to watch that just wasn't getting it for me, and then this one, um, I remembered vaguely seeing it, but I didn't remember seeing it enough that it would like ruin anything for me. Like I figured I could watch the whole thing, and but I remembered thinking about how horrified I was <laughs> to be in that coffin, yeah. as I discussed earlier. So I was like, okay, let me check this movie out. So it was actually completely new to me. I didn't. I must have seen it in 1988, and so that's a long time ago. And um, I didn't remember it, and so I, I was very, I was very happy with it. I thought it was really entertaining. Oh, I, I definitely agree. I, I had a very fun time watching it. I, I mean, I, I, I always had been interested because Wes Craven, and then I also, uh, I've read the the nonfiction book Serpent and the Rainbow, and so I was like, really, yeah. and yeah, and I'll, I'll talk about that a little bit after we're done with the movie, but. Yeah, I was just like, how did they make that into a movie? Because it's very, um, very, uh, just scholarly in the way it approaches everything. Um, it's just you know, very much about kind of the folklore and the sociology and uh, all of that. And so I was just like, what is like? There's no story here. What 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 is this movie? Um, and I'm glad I finally saw it. So this is this is the first time you'd seen it as well. Then. Correct. Oh, interesting. That is interesting. What do you think, NJ? Uh, I am a sucker for anything that is zombie or you know zombie adjacent. Um, so I I greatly enjoyed it. I will admit I don't know a lot about like 
you know, voodoo and, and the cultural aspects that all go, you know, behind it. But I, I very much enjoyed this flick. Heck yes. Um, so, uh, do you want to give us, like, a super condensed plot summary? and Or, I mean, it doesn't have to be super condensed. Well, so the uh, uh, Ivy League anthropologist Dennis uh, travels to Haiti to try to find a, a zombie drug, which is supposed to make people die, but able to come back to life after burial. Um, so he ends up in the basically in the crosshairs of a, an evil priest because we we see the, the we see the good voodoo people and then we see the bad voodoo people who's also the head of the secret police in Haiti and um, he ends up having to uh, fight for his life to keep from being buried alive basically while he tries to get this this substance that is supposedly the cause of zombifying folks um, trying to get it back to his patrons who want to pay for it to make an anesthetic out of it um so it's it's super interesting because i you know i it was interesting because when i was looking at the date of it because it actually they actually um base it they put it in in the midst of uh the overthrow of baby doc uh to Valier, if i'm pronouncing it right the dictator a very brutal dictator in haiti and it was interesting because the the movie came out in 1988 but uh baby doc was only overthrown in 86 so they must have written it while they were making it <laughs> do you know what i mean like it seems like they must have changed it as it went along and 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 in essence, I think they got thrown out of Haiti or had to be removed from Haiti during the filming and switched to the Dominican Republic because it was so um, in such a upheaval in Haiti. It wasn't safe. Uh, so there's that sense, right, of, of being placed within like this very real uh, craziness. Yeah, they get. Yeah, so there's a human conflict and there's a. Uh, potentially uh, supernatural conflict that all co- sort of comes together. Yeah, yeah, uh, and 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 yeah, you're 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 dead right. Yes, they they had f- done a lot of initial filming in Haiti, and then because uh, things were getting so so nasty in Haiti relative to that whole overthrowing of the regime, yeah, they uh, decided that they uh, didn't want to risk all of their crew's lives and move to a safer location uh, nearby, yeah, the Dominican Republic, so. Yeah, and, you know, um, which is now, it may not be that safe either, I don't know, but it's certainly not what I, for some reason, the, the political upheaval, uh, um, I think they had their own dictator, Trujillo, during that period of time, who was pretty, uh, the both of them, Baby Doc and Trujillo, were quite, quite brutal. And, and one of the things about this that I found interesting was when we took, you know, talking about what's terrifying. I would say what terrified me in this movie was like it was okay being buried alive, but also that the the evil priest who's the head of the secret police is just routinely like torturing people in the most heinous ways. <laughs> so this guy is actually running from being tortured and killed and being buried alive um and so it makes for there's a lot of tension there and i it goes back to that thing i was talking about where you know when you look at like social horror like what's worse the human horror or the supernatural and the two things together you know are are greater than the parts in terms of i think how how it works out in the movie oh i i definitely agree and 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 you know kind of getting into the things that uh you know we really liked yeah, that was kind of the first note that I had was that the villain, uh, yeah, so Petraud. I don't, I, I don't have the best French or Haitian accent for, for pronouncing I names. No so idea, yeah. <laughs> anyway, Petraud, uh, is what, what I'm going to say. Uh, yeah, he is just chilling, right? Like, like he is so sadistic, uh, manipulative, and, and yeah, that he's able to bring that real life, you know, evil dictator's right hand kind of thing uh, you know, the torture scenes are pretty harrowing. They are. <laughs> but then also, yeah, that supernatural side, too, that, that he is this, you know, sorcerer, and that he is able to 
do things um, to Dennis and to others that are real upsetting that you know that he has captured souls and he's going to you know use them to to continue to to haunt and and torture Dennis you know even when Dennis returns to the United States with the the uh wonderful uh chilling scene with the the hand Yeah that was ama- that was insane and I didn't actually expect that I thought the people were incredibly obnoxious but I didn't expect I didn't expect her to um <laughs> Do what you did. Yeah, I yeah. was like, okay, all right. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But you know, that actor was just amazing. I, I don't know his name. I've seen him in a bunch of stuff, but I, I don't know anybody's name. Frankly, I'm the worst. But the one who played Petroud, or, or he yeah, whatever, was, whatever, whatever he was, he was, he was frightening. He did a great job. Um, I mean, I don't know if I'm should like hark back to like, and in, in, it was interesting to me to see that there were, you know, similarities between my book and this movie, like in the sense that in my book, you know, The Lower Power, which take, which is a group of uh, recovering addicts in Harlem, Washington Heights, et cetera, who are, um, who are, are basically being haunted by this evil being that is selling some, what seems to be some kind of new drug in, in Harlem, and so they're kind of, they're haunted as well, but one of the interesting things, and, you know, so they're the first line of defense against this this evil being, but, or a person, or a drug dealer, or whatever he is, and, and also most vulnerable to him, but the interesting thing is that in my book, uh, takes place in New York when there were, there were these corrupt cops that are, like, uh, Legendary. They were called the Dirty Thirty. They were arrested, I think, in nineteen in the early nineteen nineties, ninety two, ninety three, something along those lines, and they basically um, wreaked havoc on the Harlem and Washington Heights communities. They were the thirtieth precinct in Harlem, and there were about thirty two of them, and they were just ripping off drug dealers and addicts and beating people down and. And stealing, you know, half the drugs if somebody was arrested, and then and then, um, you know, booking half the drugs as being, you know, so they go to jail for half the drugs, and the cops would keep half the drugs. And so, like the idea, like for like in this in this movie, if he had a problem, he could, there was nowhere he was going to turn to to solve it because the authorities were the problem, you know. And and I thought that was interesting that there was that same parallel in um in the lower power you know where they you know the they ended up having to confront the corrupt cops rather than being able to go to cops for help you know Mm -hmm. so it was just interesting to me that 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 same motif sort of played out in both in both books in both pieces which yeah, I didn't know, like, and I didn't copy it because I didn't know. <laughs> just saying. If, if so, it was deeply buried in your subconscious, and you know that's just how storytelling works. So. Ah, yes, that's right. That's right. Either that, or a lot of people are corrupt. <laughs> One of the well, other. actually, the, the the Dirty Thirty actually existed. So actually, I just like just like what they did, where they took, they used, they wove the Haitian political issues into the book. It wasn't about those political issues, but they wove. They wove it in, and and I always find like when in writing a story, like if I'm stumped and I do research, like into like you know they might have done research about Haiti, and it just creates your plot from it. You know, like it doesn't just give you the background, but it actually you actually end up it for me it ends up enriching the plot, and I I could actually if I'm stumped I can get to the next point in a plot. So. You know those kinds of real things, like they had these really brutal police, and you know New York had these really brutal corrupt police. Um, you know, just help you to move the story along when you're writing it. Does that make sense? Oh yeah, oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> just checking if you're still there. <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, we were just uh, in awe of, of the great words that you were saying. <laughs> about how we can apply it to our own writing. It's, you know. Okay, I, I, I'll pay you after we get off. <laughs> Thank you for saying that, yes. But it, but it was actually surprising to me, like, like, like what, you know, some of the, how that came out. Yeah. 
Um, NG, what are things that you liked about it, too? I really liked... Um, I thought that the practical effects held up pretty well, yeah. to be honest. Um, the, the, like, bride, the mummified bride really freaked me out. Um, with the, like, you know, she unhinged her jaw and whatnot and the snake. Like, oh, yeah. That creeped me out pretty good. And it, it still looks great. That's what, isn't that true? Like, because I was thinking that myself, because a 1988 movie, a lot of times you look at it and you're like, oh my God, do I, do I have to watch this? Because, like, it's so bad, the effects. This, I thought they were good. Yeah, I, I didn't have a problem with them. I feel like a, a lot of it's like, like Jurassic Park, right? The, um, like, the T-Rex was legitimately real and, like, animatronic and it still holds up. Like, it's kind of like what this is, I feel like. Like, that was an actual, like, model and, and things that I imagine that they probably used. So it looks legit. Yeah, I, I, I feel like, like, late 80s and early 90s, when when you had the the films that actually had a budget and, and knew what they were doing with special effects, I think a lot of those look better than any, you know, digital effects that come, you know, even just shortly after that because, I mean, yeah, Mid '90s, suddenly everything is is digital effects, and it all looks terrible because they didn't know what they were doing yet. Oh, that's interesting. Uh, but but yeah, like I think the fact that like these actors can interact with these um, practical effects that you know Bill Pullman is actually you know face to face with this you know bride mummy thing um, that they made really makes for so much more of an authentic viewing experience. Like even if you know sometimes you see some of the seams of of the the effects. I th- still think it ultimately makes for better movie making. Um, I'm a huge fan of practical effects, and I think about it way too much. Yeah, I didn't know about this stuff, so this is very <laughs> interesting. So it just shows shows why some of these, like the sort of pop ups, were much more stunning than mm-hmm. like you know than the pop ups you see in later movies. Yeah, and 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 so many of them yeah just played so effectively like even the simp- the simplicity of like the hand in the soup coming out it it got me it got me real good um <laughs> yeah. and and the fact that you know that they they did a good blend of these kind of really fun you know practical effect scares with interesting story moments and that sometimes they didn't go the direction you expected it to you know that the, the fact that the the wife of the drug company exec you know gets possessed by Petrod and and starts you know attacking um dennis with a knife yeah because you started right and you kind of thought it was gonna the direction it was going was that he was gonna lose it and make a scene and you know like that you were totally focused on what he was going through so when she went through something it was like very surprising yeah, and, and it made, you know, what was, I think, already, like, a fun scene, but, you know, kind of the thing that we've seen before where one person sees something and, and no one else does, it took that and, and took it one step further, and suddenly a new unexpected element gets thrown in. So, yeah, like, I feel like, you know, it kind of took a lot of these, you know, go-to types of scares and just added a little bit of a twist on them in a way that made them so much more effective. Yeah, that it did. So what did you guys think of the dream sequences? Um, so dream sequence wise, like I, I, I think that it's a shame that so many of the scares are in dream sequences, mm. but I will say that considering that a lot of the idea is that like Petrad is, and, and some of the other, uh, voodoo practitioners are using dreams to communicate or to manipulate, um, I, I ultimately felt mostly in the positive with them. Like, generally, I'm not a big fan of dream sequences because, you know, especially like when a movie starts out with a dream sequence, I just roll my eyes because I go, okay, yeah, so you've yeah, shown, shown me shown nothing, me nothing, nothing so, far. so far. Right, but, right. <laughs> but, but when we have this kind of thing, when we have a dream sequence that, you know, is essentially, you know, being manipulated by another character you know, where his perception of reality is getting skewed and it's affecting him because his dreams are suddenly, uh, you know, making for some real terrible sleep and, and that he's being taunted, you know, even when he is supposed to be at least mentally getting a little break. That actually made, made the dream sequences in this film actually really scary and interesting. 
You know, that's actually, you know, and it's interesting because when I heard you say that, you kind of like usually don't like dream sequences. And, you know, I, I know and NJ's read, read The Lower Power and, and it, it has those dream sequences also. So it's just interesting, again, like there's that parallel. Um, but like the funny thing about it is that like I try to make dream sequences as short as possible, if at all, mm -hmm. because I do feel like what you were saying, like you're showing me nothing, right? And, and it also, like, when I first wrote that, I wrote The Lower Power um, some time ago, and then it went through many, many iterations before it ended up, uh, and I published a couple of books before I actually came out with this one. But um, the, first, the first time through, the, one of the dream sequences was like 75 pages. <laughs> 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 the first draft of, you know, it was like so long, you know, and then, you know, you get it down to like a half a page. I mean, you really don't want long dream sequences. I, I didn't really know why, um, why Petrad was in, 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 in Serpent and Rainbow. I didn't know why Petrad was in that first vision that he had, though. Yeah, that that was definitely kind of a a problem that I have a little bit of a Yeah, that the 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 opening sequence of the movie I do have a little bit of an issue with. But we'll get to that in a minute. Um I do want to give give some more compliments about the movie too uh before we get into some things that maybe didn't work as well. Uh. An, a, another thing that I really liked is that it it I felt had a a shockingly honest uh portrayal of voodoo culture and uh of just of, of haitian culture in general and and that like it didn't treat it as like lesser or stupid or inferior like so often you know a lot of western film or pop culture will just be like you know the the silly wild voodoo stuff nonsense is is kind of how people approach it and like you know it is like a, a genuine belief system and it's you know, very complex and interesting. And so, you know, it's showing us characters who believe that and, and who, you know, maybe believe in voodoo, even though they also are doctors or scientists or things like that. And so I really liked seeing that put in a very positive light, you know, that, that you know, even if other characters don't believe in it, or maybe, you know, other characters might think that it's inferior or stupid in some way, that we have other characters who can be sincere in their beliefs um or you know sincerely just you know practicing their culture and and you know and that we get to see some of the flaws of that but also some of the like genuine goodness and, and interesting uh aspects that i think uh, a lesser film would have just kind of glossed over yeah or they would have played it for like laughs or something yeah yeah yeah, yeah. uh great great kind of counter example is um the movie white zombie from like 1930 or something where it you know also has voodoo zombies and stuff like that but yeah ultimately it, it feels much more dismissive or silly mystical without actually like showing any of the actual beliefs yeah That's i think that, you know it, like any any uh i think it was pretty much showing that like any religious or spiritual beliefs there you know there are uses for it and there are misuses and i think i think we could say that about any any religion so yeah i would say that they definitely um and i think that was only fair given that the person who had originally written the book was i believe was trying to respectfully talk about uh the the voodoo practices in Haitian culture right yes. so it would be like it would be pretty it, it, it would that would be kind of messed up if they kind of didn't keep in you know with the spirit of his book in that sense thankfully yeah. he was there he was there on the set you know yeah yeah but I mean but it wouldn't it wouldn't have been the 50th time that that you know the the intentions of an original you know text get ignored oh true that uh, never happens. What are you talking about, Nathaniel? Come on. Don't get me started. <laughs> <laughs> I, I like winding you up. It's fun for me. <laughs> is, this, is this personal experience you, for you, Nathaniel? Or like you had, have they destroyed some work of yours? Oh, no. No, is, not, no. no I'm, I'm not that far along in my, my writing career yet. But 
just just you know like i think i think we've all like had some book that we just adored and then we go to see the movie and we're like oh yeah oh that's spat in that one's face well actually i felt that i was very disappointed in world war z the movie yeah it was not remotely the same kind of thing yeah yeah so you didn't you did you guys enjoy it or were you like Meh. Well, I was so disappointed. Once I saw it the second time, I, I kind of enjoyed it because I had no expectation. But the first time I saw it, I was just so irritated. Because the, the first, the book was like so full of amazing satire and uh, political commentary. And none of that was there. And, and, and that the book is, is so many different perspectives, right? Like that's what, what made it work. And so I think the World War Z movie is a decent zombie movie but it's not world war z it's just you know they 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 paid for the the catchy title and then disregarded the entire book so did you did you both read the book first and then see the movie yeah absolutely and i was so excited about the movie that's what was so bad i was because i there was no zombie book i loved more than world war Z, z and i you know, and it was, it was like it, the, the whole story was pieced together from all over the world, from, from you know, like from a, you know. From Soldier in Yonkers to a Japanese right. kid climbing down to the next balcony. Thank, yeah, exactly. It was just, and they just pieced this world together and it was just amazing what he did with that book. But the movie, yeah, no. See, because I, I think I saw the movie first and then I read the book. So like. You know, I just enjoyed the movie for the, you know, camp, you know, the action scenes and fat, fast zombies freak me the hell out. Um, so then when I read the book, it like it kind of supplemented the movie, I guess, a little bit for me. Yeah, it's just so different. It should have been like a found footage, like like anthology movie, essentially. I just keep diverting you guys from the what we're supposed to be talking about. <laughs> hey, uh, that's just how how conversation works. And it's magical. We love it. We love it. But apparently we all have strong feelings about World War Z. So we'll have to have you back to talk about the book in great detail. Oh my god, uh, okay. yes. Well, we should have talked about it in like 2004 when it was written. Because, <laughs> I mean, like you wouldn't know, NJ, if you saw this like 20 years later that he was talking about Paris Hilton. Like, you know, like it would know, you would know exactly who he was talking about because it was so in line with like pop culture and the, the current politics. It was, it, you know, it was pretty amazing. I think he had Giuliani in there as like a buffoon of some sort. Um, I do too in my book, another pitch in <laughs> my book, but, but on goes unnamed. Yes. I, I mean, you know, you could just say Giuliani and then, you know, he. The, the buffoon thing is just implied. Right. Well, I didn't name him. I just had a U.S. attorney who was a buffoon. <laughs> and we <laughs> running, all just... Running for mayor in 1992. Yeah. Hmm. No, no idea. Of no idea who that, who that was. Yeah. 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 And how does that play into, like, sort of a apocalypse in New York City? Anyway, get... Us. Yes. So, uh... We were talking about what we like about. Oh yes, uh, yes. Uh, you know, the serpent and the rainbow. We we we've been very focused. Um, <laughs> well, should we go with what we didn't like? Yeah, we could we could switch gears a little bit. So I mentioned earlier that that opening in like the Amazon with some random shaman in the Amazon and seeing a vision about a jaguar and then wandering to the Amazon to make his way back to the United States really didn't have much to do with the rest of the movie, kind of? He, he, he brought, well, he, you know, I mean, I remember they said that he went 200 miles through the Amazon, so that, so they felt like he was a trooper and he brought back some stuff, right? So they felt like he was good at finding stuff, like stuff like this, the stuff in Haiti that they wanted him to find. But, it's sort of like overly right coincidental that mm. he gets the him having that medication or whatever the, the 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 substance that they gave him in the Amazon where they wanted him to see some stuff. So everything is connected, right? And he gets he gets sort of primed, right, to be vulnerable 
to whatever happens to him in Haiti, but it's just too many coincidences that have nothing to do with each other. Yeah, in a and, sense. And, and, and then and then yeah, it, like introduces all of the all of this imagery that they keep bringing up, but that actually has nothing to do with Haiti, like the jaguar that keeps appearing in all of his dream sequences, and you're like. I'm not exactly sure if that's supposed to be like him being resilient or the dangers he's facing or somehow both of those things. Or may, or maybe he's the, that's a spirit animal, but like, who cares? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. It just like ultimately, I, I think they're 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 bringing in too many of these other like cultural elements that aren't Haitian culture, and so then it just kind of gets a little muddy. Mm. Which I can say, so I, I see what you're saying. I, I interpreted it, I guess, in a little bit of a different way because he was in the Amazon, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and he's having the shaman, you know, make him this stuff and, oh, you're going to see stars. So I almost interpreted it like as an ayahuasca kind of ceremony. Like, are you guys familiar with that? With that? Mm-mm. So um, in... In, in medicine and whatnot, there's actually a push um, to, you know, like try to get away from like pharmacological stuff. Um, and people are actually using like psychedelics to use through like psychotherapy. And interestingly enough, in Africa, there's a, a medicine called ibogaine that it's, it's relatively um, powerful. Like it does have kind of a, mortality rate if it's not done correctly but people that have done this they actually like it cuts all of their cravings for heroin and stuff and it's like it's more advantageous than a lot of the things that we do now like suboxone or methadone or whatnot but so essentially ayahuasca it's like, and it's like a one-time thing and you don't have to be on it for the rest of your life it has a, I have to look up because um, I have a book about it but it has a fairly high success rate like I mean, it's like 70 some percent like, yeah, it's kind of crazy that that's not something that we're doing. But, you know, it's also a cultural thing. So it's it could be considered cultural appropriation, I suppose. But so ayahuasca is made um, like, have you ever heard of DMT? It's called the spirit molecule. So it's what our body, our brain releases um, whenever we die. And so that's what people think is our like, you know, you, your life replays before you pass away. So it's like, it almost opens your mind to the universe kind of thing. So I almost interpreted it as he was doing this ceremony. And then, you know, that's why he was kind of getting some insight as to what maybe was going to happen in the future to him. But, yeah, I just, and, and, and I think you're right. Like, I think that is kind of what it's getting at, but I just don't think that we need to see that. Like, to me, it just kind of gives all, of, it, it, it's like, trying to get away with foreshadowing by hitting us with a bludgeon yeah well and it's mixing things too you know it's not Haitian. it's you know they said that i think that i had i had heard that this movie was much longer at one point and he cut it down a lot so i who knows maybe there was like a a much more thorough like you would think that they could have done it shorter as opposed to it having been longer but maybe this is the shorter version of something that that provided more of a context for it could be yeah 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 i agree that it didn't work as well as a lot of the other things yeah i would have been just as happy if they had just been like hey you're this you know very good uh you know you're 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 good at going to to countries and and uh you know being an anthropologist we want you to go and check this out and i would have been like okay cool that's all the opening I need. <laughs> That's right. Off to Haiti. Here we go. Yeah, yeah, because it's like it maybe I don't know. Sometimes you could put something in the beginning of a piece, like a book or a movie, where you just get really engaged with the character because of something that they did. Like I, I there was a like, book, I can't remember what it was, but I remember like the, the, the character is in a police station and he's a cop or something and he puts his sweater around somebody's shoulder who seems like they're cold. You know, and for the rest of the book, you got me, right? So mm-hmm. maybe it was like they're trying to show like what a trooper he is. <laughs> it's, it's, it's the James Bond opening, you know, the, the last scene of a, of a James Bond movie that, that we didn't see. 
and then we get the the James Bond thing. But but instead of you know skiing down a hill and blowing something up, it's Bill Pullman tripping out in the middle of the Amazon. <laughs> I just want to snuggle a jaguar, I think, is the bottom line of this. I know it would yeah, kill me, nice. but it would be great. You're going to go out happy. Exactly. Another thing that maybe I, I have questions about, at the very least, I don't think that, that the movie answered to my satisfaction, and maybe you can give some insight here, being in the medical world, NJ. Um in what sort of universe is this uh, zombie powder useful as anesthesia, since it does basically the most terrifying version of anesthesia? Yeah, Here, like, you're, you're, you're conscious and feel everything, but you can't move. Right. I, 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 I have to second that question, NJ, because I, I, I let it go in the movie, but then afterwards I thought about it and I was like, what was that? You know? Yeah, that I was there. wondering about. Um because, I mean, technically, it's not really an anesthetic. It's more of like a paralytic, which, um, you know, we'll use in the ER to, like, intubate somebody. Um, mm-hmm. You give them a sedative medication so they don't remember anything, and then you give them a paralytic medication to, you know, they stop breathing so it's easier to intubate them. Um, and we already, like, have that, tech- you know, we have that medication already. It's... Um, Oddly enough, poison frogs, that's like their toxin, is this paralytic stuff. So sometimes you can lick a frog and it'll be hallucinogenic, and sometimes it'll paralyze you, so you just got to be careful. NJ, I, you, know, you raise a, a question for me when we talk about like horror being in the movies but also being in real life. I never understood why anybody would think that giving somebody a medication that makes them forget how much they suffered... <laughs> <laughs> the way to, I mean, you're talking about versed, right? Where they don't remember anything, but at the time that it's happening, they're going through like excruciation. It's just that they forgot about it afterwards. Like, what is that? Yeah, I mean, because a lot of the stuff we do, yeah, it's, it's a bit, um, I mean, almost like it can be brutal. Yeah, so like versed, yeah. propofol, that kind of thing. So, like, whatever they're talking about to me strikes me more as a paralytic, but. Um, if you're nefarious, I think it would probably be more useful to like torture people, to be honest with you. You know, yeah. And I wondered after the fact, actually, whether, whether that should have been what they were really like what the big bad drug company was trying to do to get that medication that they really had a military, a military purpose for it. Yeah, that would have been. That would have added more to it, I think. Mm hmm. But it would also have made the bad guy seem less bad that they, he was trying to stop them from taking it. True, true. Because he wants to use it for torture. Uh, they never really said why he wants to stop him from taking it, really, did they? Other than that, it's just taking his secrets, I guess, his, his uh, magical secrets. But again, yeah, that, that was one little bit of a... Just, yeah, it would have it been nice to have that flushed out just a little bit. Just a little bit more. Or, or, or at least, like, sometimes you just have to throw out any rational explanation so you could get to the next thing. See, I think it would have been more, like, helpful if you could, like, influence people if they were under this medicine or, you know, something like that. Like, that would have made more sense. Well, and, and getting into the actual, you know, voodoo zombie stuff, that is what it does, is it makes you seem dead, but it also... Um, makes you extremely suggestible. You know, people don't make zombies just for kicks and giggles. They do it to make slaves, uh, mindless, you know, drone slaves, essentially. And and they didn't get into that part of it, which I thought was uh, a big missed opportunity. Yeah, it should have, because then it's it's paying homage to what it actually is, you know, and it makes mm-hmm. sense. Didn't they have some people make that they were making do things? I can't remember. A little bit. Like- but but yeah, again that 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 was kind of more you know the uh, people getting possessed by like the voodoo uh, deities. Um, I can't remember what they're called. Um, yeah, like like when when everyone's dancing and then they suddenly start getting like kind of more controlled by those right. those right. Um, things. At one point, I knew what they were called, but I can't remember what the the voodoo god things are called. 
That was yeah. good. Things always works. Yeah, you know, you know the things. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All I know is I would use that drug for, um, like, I would have them go to like my appointments for me or like make phone calls for me. It would be fantastic. Now that is hell. You lose control of your body, and then you have to make phone calls all day. Ugh. I know, isn't it brilliant? <laughs> that describes my personal so, oh, health. You mean if you have to be like, you know how when you have to call customer service, exactly. And you can put, yeah, you can put a zombie on. Yeah, <laughs> like when it when it's like say the phone company and you and they want you to use the AI assistant, and you're like customer service i want a live person this will really for real be screaming that you want a live person to a zombie exactly but jo- jokes on you that's also a zombie uh yes you're right you to take that full you 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 went full full out with that mm-hmm. jesus i can't win on this <laughs> having worked on the receiving end of some of those phone calls yep yep oh, that's have basically you? what it is Oh yeah. Oh, yeah. It, that must be hell. It's like the last. It's like the last place where people learn courtesy. Oh yeah. It's just uh, amazing. It took me a while to figure out that, like, if you want any sense of spiritual peace, you have to be nice to customer service people. Like in that you or like across the world that you'll never see again and will never see you again. You have to be nice to them. Yeah. It's uh. It's the uh. Uh, anon or you know, relative anonymity plus uh, convenience equals uh, giant dickwads. Right, <laughs> but it's, it's no, the and not dickwad just theory. Right, and not just convenience, but also when you're calling in a state of frustration because you're calling and you're displeased, right? Mm-hmm. And yep. so, like, you add that into it, and it's like lighting a Molotov cocktail. Oh yeah, uh, there's there's a reason I don't do that anymore. Instead, I, I get to to have a much more uplifting thing trying to get teenagers to graduate high school. Oh, that's. Are you a teacher? Yes. Oh, my husband's a teacher. He's a high school teacher too. Yep. Uh, get to get to teach uh, senior English, with, and I get to bring all of this kind of unhinged uh, energy to, to my classroom. Oh, that's so. awesome. Well, thank you. I I'm like that. one day I'm gonna do like um, never been kissed and pretend to be a student and just go sit in Nathaniel's class and just like kind of heckle him a little bit, but also have a good time. But you know what, you know, NJ, we could go to Nathaniel's class by Zoom and to, and and talk about our books and stuff like that because our books are so inappropriate for high school. That's true, That's but, but I also just love it. I have this like idea <laughs> in my head where I can like try to be the prom queen. Also, if I pretend to be a student. Well, I mean, there's not that much competition. I teach at a very small high school. So I could do it. <laughs> yep. Perfect. Interesting. I've got 200 students at my school, so yeah. Really? That is... But I do like the Zoom idea. That was also nice, yes. Yeah. I, well, I just... I love... I love... I love doing stuff like that. I don't know. Um, I will take you up on that next time I'm teaching creative writing, so... All right, I will do that. But going back <laughs> to Serpent in the Rainbow, um, <laughs> the, I had one other thing that, that was kind of a little bit of a sticking point for me, but not nearly as much as I think those other things. Um, and of course, you're welcome both to contribute anything else. But for me, it's just the ending, because I think they pulled so many things in from real life with the, the revolutionary stuff, which I think was a smart move. Unfortunately, I felt like the final battle against Petroud felt very deus ex machina like oh and then conveniently like people are are barging in and messing up his evil uh voodoo ceremony stuff so he ended up being much easier to defeat hooray i don't know, just like that wasn't satisfying to have our main characters kind of defeat him at a moment of him being you know suddenly bum rushed hmm yeah, but he was more powerful from, than 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 him, and I mean, oh yeah, for sure. Them, I mean, I, I didn't, I didn't feel any problem with it. I thought it was kind of cool, like because they, it tied everything together. And um, but I also think that I like the theme of like what you can't do alone, you could do together. So like, like when you know that that there are other forces like 
the people united can never be defeated kind of forces me. I'm, my lefty credentials here. Like I know all the chants from the, the protest marches and stuff. But, yeah, you know, yeah. the idea that it really just wasn't just them, I think, is kind of not so terrible. Oh, and, and, and I think maybe what w- would have worked better is if they had tried to work with others you know if they had mm. you know mm. like 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 if, if if it was on purpose it you know if if uh dennis and um the doctor whose name marielle who is yeah, our yeah, other major yeah. character that we haven't really been brought up um like like if if in that kind of final battle with Petrod, if they had been able to call in on others then that feels satisfying because then it is like a deliberate we're banding together to be the bad guy but to me this felt like we're trying to stand up to the bad guy and oh conveniently the door gets kicked in well and i would i would say to your point it is interesting because now that you're talking about it i'm thinking you know here this guy gets tortured in a in a prison with the secret police in Haiti, and he goes back to the country, I mean, to, to the United States, and goes and eats in that nice white tablecloth dining room with that nice family, and he's making his money, and he's, like, they're doing this thing with the drug that they stole from Haiti, you know? <laughs> and they're not compensating them in Haiti. The only thing they're giving to the Haitian dude who gave him this drug that they're going to make millions of dollars out of was that he's going to be famous, like Henrietta Lacks, Right. You know, mm-hmm. and, <laughs> and then he gets his head chopped off. And he didn't, right? And he didn't care at all about what was going on in Haiti, which is interesting because it, they didn't. It wasn't like that was all pointed out as if that was a problem. That yeah. was like actually seems almost like the filmmakers thought that that was perfectly appropriate. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The only thing that he cared about was you know what was going on with Marielle because you know they had that romantic connection. Right, he's his girlfriend, and yeah, and so it it is true that he did. He seemed a little bit less connected with his career. He couldn't like just focus on his career because he cared about her. But yeah, it was all about him. That's interesting because you know, and, and and I actually some of that stuff, it, I don't know. It, it's a little bit offensive. Yeah, I, I I agree. It's it's one of those things where I think if if the if if I had to you know suggest rewrites it would be hey let's make the reason that he goes back not just be tied to a girl um you know yes she's cool but let's you know have it be he's also maybe like hey but like we need to do something about Petrod because he's a monster um and i don't want him to hurt anyone uh that would be much more interesting and noble and would be a little white savior maybe but still would have more actual meaningful human connection because it tries to show us that he has these connections to all these people but does he because yeah as soon as he's in the united states the only name that comes up is oh but marielle i I can't reach her right great (laughs) yeah no that was interesting like now that you say that like (laughs) yeah and it's, it's interesting that i didn't even like think about any of it when i was watching it I was just totally in the moment watching the movie. Not like it's it, that's I think, you know, one of the reasons why um, a lot of our stuff is is subconscious. Yeah, yeah. You know the messages we get. You know, that was interesting. But anyway, but I did like the revolution, and maybe that's because you know I'm an old lefty. <laughs> and I was like, oh yay, they overthrew the dictator, and I was glad it was in there. I mean, it does feel good to watch an evil Haitian dictator and his lackeys get taken out. Yeah. Yeah, it does. Um, one movie I wanted to just throw out there. I didn't realize that it was voodoo until I had watched this, and I was like, oh, shit. Yeah, this movie. Um, have you ever seen Jagged Mind? It's on Hulu streaming. I've never even heard of it. So we, yeah, my wife and I, we just randomly picked it. Um, and essentially... It's um, it's LGBTQ, and it's this woman that starts dating this like very mysterious um, woman named Alex. And at first, the relationship seems very idyllic and, and whatnot, but um, she starts suffering from like memory loss, blackouts, and it almost seems like she's like caught up in these time loops. 
Um, it, and it does take place in Little Haiti in uh, Miami. And it, it turns out that her uh, new girlfriend is using voodoo to, like, control her. Interesting. Yeah, it's a good movie. Hmm. Just check it out. Would recommend. I'll have to get, like, a pirate subscription to Hulu if you use somebody's <laughs> password. <laughs> <laughs> You know, after a while, you got, you know, how many can you own? Like, how many? And then oh, the, yeah. the FBI kicks your door down, and they're like, who are you borrowing Hulu from? Exactly. Yeah, no, I just got kicked off of uh, my, my friend's Netflix, and I'm very sad about it. Netflix uh, finally got, got on me. I'm just worried about when they, like, start to say that you can't, like, when your kids get to be, like, 40 like my kids are 21 but you know like at some point they might say you know they need their own netflix because i've got subscriptions all over the world people using my netflix and you know and my my kids you know are, are all over the world so oh they, they, they might be on to you soon they're they're really cracking down on one household <laughs> exactly and i we're in three yeah so uh should we talk ratings house uh, I guess starting with Screams, uh, on a scale of 1 to 10, how scary was this movie for everybody? I, I'd give it a solid 6. Same. I was thinking more in the 7 range because I did find the t both the torture scenes and the burial scenes pretty scary. But uh, like the pop-ups pop and all of that other stuff, not so much. But those two things were pretty scary to me. Yeah, yeah, those were definitely kind of the standout scary moments. Yeah, I think that's kind of why I, I went a little bit lower is because like those were really about it that that got under my skin. But eh, six, seven. I mean, like it it it's one of those it it uh keeps you alert, keep get gets a little bit under your skin, but doesn't you know doesn't keep you uh, with the lights on at night. Mm -hmm. Now let's talk crowns. Just kind of you know pure rating. Uh, you know one to ten scale. How much do you like this movie? Um, Michelle, do you want to go first this time? I guess, I guess it's a six. Yeah, a six or a seven. I mean, I definitely, for a horror movie, I hate to say it, but, um, you know, I, it's, I think it's a, a, a cut above most horror movies. I think that's fair. I, I would probably give it, yeah, like high six to seven. I'll round up to seven. Um, I, I think it was a lot of fun. Um, I think, you know, we, we see a lot of, Wes Craven doing what he does well, but you know, but but as a whole, I would say it's you know kind of uh, a B level work from from Wes Craven. It's it's no scream. Let's be real. Right. No Nev Campbell. That's fair. Um, I'd give it a six because I feel like that there needed to be more Jaguar scenes. <laughs> See, I would have given it a higher score if there were no Jaguar scenes. <laughs> Well, you know, but then, but then an extended sequence just during the credits where it's just a jaguar for no reason. Just... I saw like a one of those like clickbait videos today of a tiger playing with a red ball in the water. Have you ever seen that? I mean, yes. I could watch that all day. Oh, yeah. I could watch that all day. I just want to hug a jaguar. That's all. It's it's fine. That that does sound like you. So I'm just I wanted to share a couple brief thoughts about the Serpent and the Rainbow book. Um, as as I mentioned, you know that that's one that I had read. And other than it having a, a lack of story, um, it's, it, it is a really interesting book. Um, so it is by Wade Davis, uh, who is an anthropologist. And yeah, basically he just kind of talks about how, yeah, he wanted to learn more about uh, Haitian voodoo culture. And um, so he goes and he, yeah, like really just digs and digs and digs and tries to find people who are willing to show him uh all of the things and you know he's like hey so what's up with the zombies like is this a real thing is this like something that happens and they're like yeah I mean, it's not super common but like it does happen and he gets someone to show him the the zombie uh powder making process and 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 everything that's involved in in making someone into a zombie um so like that element you know does kind of get pulled into the movie but they actually showed a much less unpleasant version because um, the some of the things that go into the real rituals, uh, especially yeah, some of the really dark rituals like making zombies, um, often involves uh, 
murdering uh, babies uh, and using them, them for some of their components. Um, so it was really upsetting to read. Um, wow, do you think that's true? Yeah, I mean, it, it, he, the, he wrote this very anthropologically and, and like, you know, not judgmentally at all, but like he does go into some really horrifying things and it's like, yeah, I personally, you know, uh, uh, was opposed to a lot of this stuff, but like, you know, this is everyday life to, to uh, you know, especially like, you know, some of the, the darker sorcerers. Uh, but, you know, he's like, but then a lot of other people, you know, in, in Haiti are also very opposed to it. And so it's, you know, kind of, he you know, from an anthropological standpoint, he's, you know, kind of getting into the, hey, um, what the you know, kind of more extreme uh, voodoo practitioners are doing is not representative of the whole, but it does happen in certain contexts. But you know, the the movie Believers was about that. Yeah. Yeah, and, and so, you know, I, I think, yeah, this is the uh, hardcore extremist that he, you know, ended up going fully down the rabbit hole with. Um, but but then, yeah, does does take pains to, to clarify that, like, no, like most people who who uh, practice voodoo are, are much more just kind of, you know, it's it's a religion, it's a spiritualism thing. There are rituals, but it's not, you know, like everyone's going out around murdering babies. It's only a handful of people who are doing something that extreme. And uh, I don't know. It was really interesting. Worth picking up. It just you know as as a uh, anthropological study. But yeah, not like a super dynamic read. It's it's it, it was interesting as a one-time thing. So we've talked a, a, a bit about the lower power, but um, would love for you to give uh, uh, a full-blown pitch so people know that they definitely want to read it because uh, I've read it and I enjoyed it a great deal. I know NJ's read it and enjoyed it, so. Uh, all right. Well, so the the lower power is a is a very gritty supernatural thriller. It takes place in 1992 in the midst of the New York City crack epidemic. Uh, back when the um, you know back of the days of abandoned buildings and very high crime rate and corrupt cops running around, and so there's a group of recovering addicts, uh, one in particular uh, named Raven, who's overcome her. Uh, addiction. She's ready to go to law school, but her and her, you know, friends seem to be getting night terrors, and a lot more people are starting to relapse and use drugs and disappearing and committing acts of uh, violence. And and as we go on, we learn that there's a what appears to be or is purporting to be a new drug epidemic gripping the city, but with the cops being corrupt and a U.S. attorney. <coughs> <laughs> campaigning for mayor and riots, you know, race riots, hamstringing the city's defense. Raven and her friends, along with a journalist who's trying to help a teenage prostitute, have to stand up to the man behind everything. But the only problem is that they, as, you know, recovering addicts, may be the only line of defense, but they are also the most vulnerable to his inexplicably attractive powers. And so the tagline is, when evil pulls you back to the hell you thought you'd escaped. Killer tagline. That's killer fantastic. Pitch. And uh, I have to say, a killer book. Like, I'm not usually the most, uh, like, not, not the biggest, like, you know, kind of more crime story reader. Obviously, you know, I, I, I enjoy at least smatterings of it. But, you know, most of the horror books I, I'm picking up are... A little bit more, I don't know, haunted housey or monstery, but but the way that you approached, you know, the the crime elements very realistically, and and you know that you're able to kind of bring in some of your um, real life insight to a lot of that, it really made it a very dynamic read that I enjoyed a great deal. When you crafted characters that you really actually, like you, the reader cares about them, you know, I was a nervous frickin' wreck for Raven the entire time. Ugh. Um, and now knowing more of the history, like I, I didn't know anything really about like the Dirty 30 or anything. Mm. Um, oh, yeah. So that adds just even more to the story, knowing that like this is legitimately kind of shit that was going on back then. 
Yeah. Well, you know, I mean, not to get too far off the track, but, you know, I what I do for a living now is, you know, I'm I'm helping people coming out of prison after 30, 40, 50, you know, almost 50 years in prison. And there's a lot of people in New York being exonerated now who have done decades in prison who were set up by these guys. Mm -hmm. Wow. You know, so it was a real a real thing. Yeah, I, I had a, a, a lot of fun, I mean, for those. For anybody who's really a, you know, geek on New York City history, like I, I mean, the race riots were based on real things, like the shootings. They, they were all based on real things. So that you don't, you don't need to know that stuff to enjoy it. But, but I did have a lot of fun with it, you know, which I tend to do in all my books. I always. I'm just kind of a history geek, so I like knowing the the little things that play into it. So it just it, it enhances it for me now knowing that. Yeah, there was there was a riot. There was a, a, a during that period there was a drug dealer killed by the cops in Washington Heights, where there were you know riots starting because they um, because. People were upset because the cops, even if he was a drug dealer, the cops kind of just murdered him. And the, uh, you know, you're not supposed to do that when you're a cop. Like, just, yeah. And, yeah, that's, um, that's a little bit of a no-no. Yeah. yeah, and Dinkins was the mayor then, and he went and visited the family of the dead drug dealer to try to get them to help calm down the community to avoid riots because back then I mean there were there were several different riots going on around the city of all different groups um, but back then and and the police union and Giuliani went after Dinkin saying he was soft on crime and there was actually a police riot you could look up you could google the 1992 police riot in New York City that where Giuliani got on top of a car and did, I believe he was on top of a car, I may, I may be embellishing that, but I believe that was it, and d gave this extremely racist speech. So you, you know, so it, it all, like, so yeah, that's not the point of the book, but it was just, it, it, I, I placed everything into a very real uh, milieu, if I pronounce that right. I always screw up that word. But yeah, and, and you know, it was very cathartic writing it. I mean, it, it it feels so real, and uh, like I said earlier, you know, any any of the spite, any of the uh, need for catharsis uh, in writing a book just makes it so much better. Yeah, and I and I think one of the things that this has shown up in a in a couple of my books um, is the fear of being pulled backwards. You know, like when I like that tagline, it's like. The fear of, you know, like you, like for a person like myself, because I went from being like a Park Avenue lawyer at 22 years old to being basically sleeping on a park bench. You know, I, I mean, I lost a great deal. I was incarcerated on Rikers Island. I went through, a, I, I completely, addiction became my full-time job. And so when I finally crawled up out of that, you know, that and built a life, like, because now I'm like, I was like, I raised 21-year-old kids who've never seen me. Like, I've, it's been 34 years since I've used a mind-altering substance other than caffeine, I admit, the caffeine and chocolate. But, um, you know, like, after you get out of that, like, it's kind of frightening the idea of somehow being pulled backwards into it. So, like, it does really realize, like, like it's cathartic in terms of, like, a fear to have, like, the supernatural power. Mm -hmm. that's pulling them backwards. So were there any other influences um, that went into this book, like other books, movies, anything else? Well, you know, I, I mean, like I was saying before that Stephen King was a huge, huge favorite of mine. And um, there's a scene in this book, like because really, um, yeah, Stephen King, Clive Barker, Peter Straub, all of those old horror books nowadays, it seems like a lot more of the horror books are very psychological, where you don't know whether it was really supernatural or whether it was like some kind of issue inside the person's head. I mean, you get that a, a lot of the books, and they're great books like Last House on Needless Street or um, the, a his, the History of Fear is like a, one of my favorite books out this year. Um, but the old books were like, you know, it. The, there was something really bad happening. <laughs> and, you know, there was, 
like I, I can't underestimate how much like these books really like saved me. And you know, there's a there's a um I have Steve I have Raven reading a Stephen King book. I don't know if you you remember it where they, it was sort of like a flashback to her domestic violence relationship mm -hmm. where she's sitting there and she's reading. I think I had her reading Tommy Knockers, but in real life I I was reading I was reading it, right? And um, and in the story, and it's just really backstory, she's, you know, she's with this guy who was like a domestic abuser, and he goes to try to hit the dog with a pipe because the dog had peed on the floor. And she, mm -hmm. steps, in the, she steps in the way between him and the dog, you know. And that, and she was reading it. Well, she was reading Tommy Marcus, but the timing wasn't right. I was reading it, and that actually happened. You know, that's how much, like, what really happened is in the book. So when you, when I, like, when I talk about, so it's a little bit of a, it, like, some people maybe would say it's a harsh read. It's like, <laughs> I mean, it, but if you could watch Serpent in the Rainbow and see them being tortured, I guess you could read my book, you know? Um... But it, so the horror is really bad. Like the bad guy is really bad, um, mm -hmm. and and but some of the the real people were really bad too, um, and the good people were really had to overcome a lot, you know. But Stephen, so I don't know. I went through all of that, but to say that like Stephen King, and all of those guys gave me moments within a really devastating time that like really got me through. And so they are like huge influences and I thank them, you know, for, for, for helping me to, to stay together until I could get myself together. Yeah. I think especially, you know, with, with Stephen King, how, how much his own, you know, struggles with addiction kind of make their way into some of his books, you know, obviously uh, misery is a, is a good example of that. Um, but yeah, like seeing how how powerful addiction can be woven in, I'm sure that was also uh, well. Cathartic. You know, he didn't. Crazy. It's interesting that you say that because I don't remember that so much in his early books. Like I think he was just drunk when he wrote the early books. <laughs> like I don't, I don't think I don't remember. I, am I wrong about that? Because I don't remember him uh, in his prime, like in his days before he. I don't know when he got sober. Probably around the same time I did. You know, um, I would yeah, say what so, 90s maybe. Um, 90s. It was. See, I should know this. Um, so he, yeah, his his very first few books, it was mostly alcohol that he was using. Although I think and he then, said that Cujo he wrote during like a coke binge, and he doesn't remember oh, really? any of it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. He doesn't remember writing Cujo at all. That's hilarious. <laughs> um, but but yeah, so I would say probably after like the success of like Shining, mostly is when he started getting into uh, cocaine and and a bunch of other stuff. And then yeah, uh, he ultimately yeah kind of cleaned up a ramp like a little bit before he wrote Misery. But I know Misery, you know, a lot of the um, the ways that he has you know Paul Sheldon, um, you know struggling with with his addiction to the opioids that that Annie's giving him. I, and you know, it's so funny. I hated that book the most of his. Like, I mean, I don't hate is a strong word, but I, you know, because it was a Stephen King book, but it was my least favorite. I think I don't like body horror that much. Yeah, I mean, it, it gets pretty brutal with, with the, the axe in that book. Um, but but yeah, like, like, I mean, essentially, Annie in that book is supposed to be in many ways like a physical manifestation of addiction. And so it's really interesting to, to see how much that has kind of influenced his writing. And then, of course, after he had his uh, getting hit by the van incident, then he also had Wait, a few So books. was he on the side of the road? Was he drunk during that, or was he just the victim? Because I know it, he was, it was a drunk driver that hit him, but I didn't know if he was drunk when he was walking. No, I no, he was, he, he was just taking a, a morning walk. Um, yeah, no, he, he, he was not using at that time. But then, of course, you know, the recovery process he had to go through some some uh, addiction recovery as well because you know you get hooked again i and jay you might appreciate this i was reading misery while i was waiting to go into surgery like i had like an emergency surgery <laughs> back when misery came out and so i'm laying you know 
I'm laying there like right outside the operating room and all of the everybody starts coming over to me and they're like, you're reading misery now. <laughs> <laughs> and then was your nurse named Annie Wilkes? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. You're like, I'm out. I'm not doing this. <laughs> And as long as, you know, they didn't chop off your feet with a uh, an axe and, and then, you know, cauterize it, then, then you're probably okay. Yeah, they, I don't think there was any malpractice that day. It's only if well, it's covered good. by your insurance. We don't just do that for anybody. Right. Right. Man, I need to get better insurance. <laughs> <laughs> then you could be a pirate for Halloween and get a little peg leg. It'll be fun. That's the dream. There's a whole pirate, like adventure in uh, for Halloween in my neighborhood I'll be the best part there we go just gotta get that insurance I can do that it for you I can do it at uh, Stoker con probably I mean it's not <gasps> it won't be hard hooray are you guys going to Stoker con yeah. Oh, yeah are you going where is that it is in San Diego this year and when is that uh, May... it's yeah late May early June yeah, it's that weekend to... essentially. Yeah, um, well, yeah. I'm gonna write it down, and uh, because I know that my um, my audiobook uh, publisher is like asking me when am I going to conventions. I mean, it's just like it's a lot, you know, to pay for airfare to go to conventions. Oh yeah, <laughs> like uh, it is. It is May thirtieth through June second. In San Diego. That sounds very nice. Uh, it will be magical, and you should come, and we will all have dinner together. Yes, that would be nice, and I could come and sign sign audio 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 tapes or whatever. <laughs> I'm just picturing like a you know like the big uh, VHS tape, but you're like signing it. What do you call them? So am I sounding stupid here? No. no. What do you say? MP3? No, it's not. It's it's not. Nobody buys those anymore. No. I don't really actually know why they make them. Um, like yeah, you I can't don't know. use it in a car. I, but they, my publisher, they they have that as an option. I'm not. Exactly I mean, a few sure people why. buy them, but but no, no. I, I just assume that that, that you're going to have like people open up their Audible account and then you just like sign their phone. <laughs> oh, <laughs> yeah, that is a problem. Yeah, we'll, well it's fig okay. we'll figure it out. We'll figure it out. We got time. Well, I don't know what, to, I mean, I guess what my, the audiobook publisher probably just brings, up, well, what do they do? Yeah. Usually I see them have like uh, a box of like basically QR code, QR um, codes on a, on a, on cards. And, and that's usually what I see people do for. For shamelessly plugging uh, audiobooks, I have but... QR codes on my on my card. I have well, a there card we go. That I'm very proud of myself actually about that. So, NJ, do you have QR codes on your card? I have a QR code on my bookmark that takes you to like my personal site. My my what wife I'm set it here up. Is, is that you need to step up, scrub, and also get it on your card? I know. One day I'll I'll be cool like Michelle, but probably not today. I mean, you know, we, it's something to aspire to. Yeah, goals. Well, shifting gears, uh, how is everyone staying spooky lately? What is some uh, horror media that you have enjoyed? I know, Michelle, you already mentioned yours. Uh, oh, Attack yeah, I did mention t Attack the Block, yeah. I'm adding it to my watch list. See, I don't know. I love, see, I don't, I'm kind of, I love, uh, what was it? Uh, love and Monsters, That, but that's not horror. That's sort of sci-fi, right? Yeah, I mean, it's horror adjacent. Yeah, I love that movie. <laughs> you could see that, like, I, I'm just, you know, I don't know, uh, I guess I'm a, a, a softie for a horror fan, right? You enjoy good content, that's all it is. Yeah, yeah. yeah and really, frank, truthfully, I'm mostly uh, reading and, and listening to audibles, because I, I don't have that many hours to... to um, watch oh yeah same I, I i always end up listening to to podcasts and books way more than i end up watching stuff yeah which is why i don't want to pay for hulu <laughs> fair <laughs> uh nj how are you staying spooky 
I just started reading A Head Full of Ghosts by Paul Tremblay, who is going to be, uh, I believe, a guest of honor at StokerCon this year. I met him last year, and he was a delight. Really? Damn. You're lucky. Because I read Survivor Song, and I enjoyed that one, but um, I'm not too far into this, but essentially it's it's like a retelling of a family in which the teenage daughter is she it sounds like she's schizophrenic like newly diagnosed schizophrenic but uh i think she's actually possessed so stay yeah, tuned and it's like a it's a uh about a like reality show you yeah, know i i just i i read head full of ghosts a couple of months ago i thought it was great i really enjoyed it yeah, yeah my, i mean my... yeah i i'm reading a lot of books i just thought we were just talking about movies but yeah, Head Full of Ghosts is great. My favorite book by Tremblay was uh, Cabin at the End of the World, which was made into the unfortunate Knock at the Cabin movie. Um, and I'll just say that when I met Paul Tremblay, he was wearing a shirt that just said the book was better. Oh, and no. He, he, and, and he made no additional comments. Uh, <laughs> about that. But, but I think that that spoke for it, because that book was so good and so harrowing. Um, highly recommend. Yes, uh, buckle up. It is. Mm. It, it 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 gives uh, some of the best of kind of like weird culty horror and also home invasion horror, um, it, and it just meshes them in in a truly terrifying, harrowing way. So what you're saying is to read the book before watching the movie, or just only read the book. Yeah, I'd probably just do that. Okay, got it. You know, I'm uh, reading Lone Women now. Have you guys heard of that? Oh, uh, Victor Laval? Yeah. I haven't read it yet, but I love his stuff. Um, yeah, me too. I, I read the, the Devil in Silver recently, which I thought was, was really good. Although maybe fell off a little bit at the end. But, yeah. Um, yeah. But Lone yeah. Wo- Women so far is, seems very original. I definitely want to read that one. And I also loved his uh, The Changeling, also a book that messed me up. How did it mess you up? No spoilers, um, though. Just, it deals with the changeling mythology in uh, a very brutal way uh, of, you know, hey, what what happens if you believe that your baby has been replaced? And maybe I read it at the wrong time because I had, like, a, a six-month-old when I read it. And, uh, you know, it was it was the wrong time to read that book, uh, but it... <laughs> But it made it really, really effective. Are you just staring at your baby like, I don't know. Yeah, it was, it was, uh, I mean, it didn't make me think it, my son was a changeling, but I was just like, oh, oh my gosh. But the pain That's... of a parent would really hit you hard. Oh yeah, it's, it, yeah. it really taps in. Well, I've been staying spooky lately, mostly just, uh, I've been really enjoying a, uh, a podcast called the Random Number Generator Horror Podcast Number 9, which is a mouthful. Um, but it's it's made by the people who make uh, Welcome to Night Vale. Um, it's uh, the voice of Night Vale, uh, Cecil, uh, and one of the writers of, of Night Vale. Um, they basically just uh, watch a horror movie every week uh, and then kind of by dice rolls uh, figure out what their next movie is going to be. And so, like, one of them is kind of a newbie to horror, one of them is more of a horror veteran. Um, but, yeah, like, whatever they get, you know, gets picked is, is very randomized. And so, it's funny because, like, episode two is just, like, randomly, like, Children of the Corn 2. Uh, because that's, you know, kind of how they roll the dice. So, it's a lot of fun. You know, it has some good discussion on, on horror. It's pretty insightful because they're good, you know, actors and writers and and just you know kind of creators in something that's horror adjacent with welcome to night vale um and yeah i enjoy it a lot well before we let you go where can people find you online michelle well you can find me in a lot of places the easiest place to find me and contact me i will see it if you if you if you contact me on my contact sheet is my Website, it's easiest place to, to remember, is michellewmiller.com. But I'm on Twitter, I'm on Threads, I'm on TikTok, I'm on Facebook. Uh, 
IG not as much because all they do is they spam me on IG trying to get me to pay for promotion. You see that, NJ, yourself? Oh, yeah. Oh, my God. And they're slick, too. Um, but anyway, so I'm getting tired of IG. But uh, MichelleWMiller.com, but Twitter, I'm, I, I would say I'm most active on Twitter. But TikTok also, I, I make whatever silly videos I make with Great, my dog. Right. And we will drop the, the, the links to all of the stuff in the show notes. So everyone, uh, go follow Michelle and also go read her books. Um, in any other final words of, of wisdom or uh, insight before we uh, wrap this podcast up, anybody? No, just thank you for coming on. I absolutely loved the book. And whenever we had the opportunity to get you on, I was like, oh, hell yeah. So thank you, Michelle. Was, thank you so much. I feel like I've known you forever. And- I know. Yeah, like I, <laughs> I feel like you were one of my first Twitter friends or something. <laughs> yeah, I don't know what it is. But yeah, I don't feel like this is the first time we've spoken. And I feel like, you know, so we must be like... uh Brothers or sisters from another mother. I think you're supposed to say brothers from another mother, but whatever. Yeah, I think that must be. We, we, in other words, we've known each other in a past life. Sisters from another mister. Ah. Yeah, there you go. There you have it. Sister <laughs> from another mister. That's good. And Nathaniel, thank you also for having me. I appreciate you guys. Um, it was a delight. Thank you for being here. Um, and we will definitely uh, bug you about maybe coming back again in the future. I would love to do that, and I will send you some links, which I haven't sent you guys yet. All right. Well, we will definitely include those in the show notes. Uh, Everyone out there, stay spooky. Stay spooky.